Then next in planning the program um, for this year, we uh, decided that we should ask the ADA to come tell us about things they're doing in evidence-based dentistry because as you're aware, there's um, uh, much more emphasis on evidence-based dentistry and programs related to telling member dentists about um, evidence-based dentistry. And so we contacted the um, ADA and I asked um, some people who have served on scientific council and things like that about who we should request um, to come talk. And, and um, the uh, answer was our, our next speaker. Uh, Julie uh, France V. Hawley is uh, director of the ADA Research Institute and Center of Evidence-Based Dentistry. Uh, she leads several of the evidence-based dentistry initiatives, uh, including the, web the website, uh, clinical recommendations, and the EBD Champions Program. And we've had several of our members participate in the Champions Program, as well as some of our uh, faculty members uh, participate in it. So we're quite pleased to have her here. She's a registered dental hygienist with a PhD from Harvard and postdoctoral research experience at UCSF. So she's gonna tell us about what ADA is doing in evidence-based dentistry, and thanks for coming. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Tim for inviting me to be here today. Um, I have been part of those people, the sidelines, watching these PBRNs and anxiously awaiting your data because we feel that your data will help us do some of the work we do at the ADA in regards to EBD. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about is what do we do? Um, I'd like to start out with this picture. Pictures tell a thousand words. And it's such an interesting picture. It's from UIC Dental School about late 1800s. And if you look at these gentlemen, these dental students, um, there's a lot of things that are different. I mean, there's some obvious things. They are standing up so we didn't have chairs for the clinicians. They don't have masks and gloves, so they're not concerned or as knowledgeable as we are today about infection control. Some things are the same. They still have a handpiece, different types of handpieces, but we're still looking at a surgical model of repairing decay. Um, the rubber dam is the same, so some things haven't changed in 100 plus years. These students likely have lots of questions, and as Dr. Danucci indicated earlier today, when they go into practice, they're going to still have questions. How do they answer those questions? Um, well, my thought is they're probably looking at two things. One is what my friend Mark Siegel calls a man who statistic. I knew a man who said. And the man who said is probably the man standing in the front of the room. The other thing is um, their own experience, that in my hands this works. And at that time, that was the best information they have. Now, this is a more current image from a dental school. I don't know what school this is. Um, we can see that we now have a chair, so our backs don't hurt so much. And we're so scared of infection control that we got rid of both the dentist and the patient. <laughs> but now we have a new tool, the computer screen. And right here, you see these digital radiographs. But it's information. Information is a tool that we have it helps you make knowledge-based decisions, and it's a chair-side tool. So that's why I love this image. So now we talk about this information. And this is um, some newscasters from the 60s and 70s. Anybody know who these are? These people are? Faye Flynn and Joel Daly. I grew up watching these guys every night at 6 o'clock news, Channel 7. And um, you'd sit down on the couch, and by the way, we'd go to my aunt's house, and at their couch, they had that nice plastic all over the couch and the rug so that you wouldn't have to worry about spilling everything. You didn't have remote control, so you turned the TV on and you watched the news, and you found out everything that was going on in the world that you needed to know, everything that was going on in Chicago, uh, the weather, the bulls, the cubs, everything you needed to know, you learned from Jill Daly and Faye Flynn. Now today, we have our remote control, so we have channel surfing. We have ABC, NBC, and CBS still, and we have CNBC, and MSNBC, and CNN, and Headline News. There's so much information. So we have access to so much information, and look what happened to the newscasters. They shrunk, because you have to have all this information. If we look um, at the upper left on my screen, um, we have someone talking about something going on in the snow. We can see some fashion information about New York Times Vogue, a plane crash, the weather. You may need to have information about your stocks. Information overload, and this is the same when it comes to dentistry. We have now access to so much information about the most current research, 
And yet, how do you find the information that's most important to you and your patient? And if you find it, how do you find, get the time to read it and critically appraise it? So we understand this is a challenge. Um, when I started the ADA in 2004, there, we had a symposium, an ABD symposium. We invited 30 to 40 stakeholders um, in a meeting, sitting around, and one of the things we discussed is what should the ADA do in terms of helping dentists implement EBD? Should we the, be the ones doing the research? Should we be the ones doing the systematic reviews? And the answer to those questions was no, because we wouldn't really make much of an impact. There are already a lot of groups doing that. They said what the ADA should do is help get this information into the hands of dentists. And they said one of the ways we should do that is by developing a website. So that gave us the foundation to develop a center for EBD, which was launched in 2007. And the center has a two-fold vision. So we have two lenses to this set of eyeglasses. The first is to disseminate the most current scientific information. And the second is to help dentists implement it. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. The first three things here, our website, our summaries, and our recommendations, are dissemination activities and tools. And the last line is some of the ways that we're helping people implement EBD. So I'm assuming that most people in this audience knows what evidence-based dentistry is. We typically, when we see any definition of evidence-based practice, there's three realms, the science or the evidence, the clinical expertise, and what that patient needs and wants are. And some people are afraid that EBD will dictate the type of, of procedures that you do or you offer your patients. But I'd like to argue it's opposite. It enables you to make knowledge-based decisions that are catered to that individual patient's needs and preferences. The ADA has a definition of EBD. We call it an approach. It's a way of making knowledge-based decisions. And we have those three elements, the scientific evidence, the dentist, and the patient in this definition. So here's our website. It was launched in 2010, last March. So it's not even, uh, actually, it's probably just about a year old at this point. Um, it was funded by a grant from the National Library of Medicine and NIDCR, so we are very thankful for them for funding this. And the neat thing is, since we got funding, it's open access to anybody worldwide. We like to think of this website as having three main buckets of information. The first bucket is our database of systematic reviews and our summaries. So we have a database of over 1,300 systematic reviews on oral health topics. They're categorized by topic. You can also do a search. Um, we think that these systematic reviews are wonderful. We know that they're wonderful. They are rich with so much information that are useful for your practitioners. And this information is buried in six to 10 pages usually, but maybe up to 200 pages of, of scientific documents. And so how do you get these, this useful information to the practitioners? This is where we came up with the concept of a critical summary. These summaries are about page to page and a half long. And they summarize the systematic view, summarize the science, and also give you the so what. What does this mean to me when I'm treating my patient? I like to think of these summaries as an onion. You have the outer layer, and you can peel the onion and get deeper and deeper into the science if you need to. So the outer layer we call an overview, and it's two sentences long. What's the conclusion of the science is the first sentence, the, the system back review conclusion. The second sentence, a critical appraisal of the evidence. And we call that the critical summary assessment. And then we have a rating, an evidence quality rating. Is it evidence good, limited, or poor? So if you're on our website, and remember I said we have 1,300 systematic reviews. We're trying to develop summaries of this. We have about 70 to 80 people involved in summarizing these systematic reviews. We are never going to get all of them summarized. Um, we have some very ambitious goals. We're going to summarize as many as we can. But right now, you'll notice that only a handful of them have summaries. How do you tell if they have a summary? You see that little, if I had a pointer, I would point to it. But that little um, green icon that looks like a piece of paper, you see two of these uh, systematic views have summaries. If you're on the website and you want some information, if you just hover over that title, we get a pop-up box. And I had to blow this up because I'm getting old and I can't read the text unless it's blown up like this. Um, so we have your systematic review conclusion, your critical summary assessment, and your evidence quality rating. For some people, that may be enough, or they may be at the chair side, they need to move on, they'll go back and read more later. 
And that's where you start peeling the onion. If you click on the title, you'll get the full critical summary, which includes two more things. It includes a structured abstract. That's a summary of the science, what the authors of that systematic review said, and a commentary, the critical appraisal, the so what. Why is this topic important? And we appraise two things. We appraise the systematic review. Did they do it the right way? Did they have a good question? Did they have a good search strategy? Did they abstract the data and analyze it appropriate? Did they do the right statistics? They may have done all that perfectly, but they may not have great evidence that was identified. So then we also appraise the evidence itself. And then the clinical implications, what do you take to your patient? How do you apply this? This is what our summaries look like. On the right, you'll see the overview box is repeated, and then we have the full summary. Some of you may have noticed that JADA also has a new feature called critical summaries. They're publishing one of these uh, a, a month. Uh, underneath the overview box on the lower right, we have some related resources. You can get to the PubMed abstract. You can get some, to some other databases. If this is a JADA article, it's open access from day one from this website as well. So now the core of the onion. How do you get to the core? How do you get access to the systematic review? Well, unfortunately, we can't post all systematic reviews on the website because there are publishing and copyright issues. We, we can post our JADA ones. But what we have here is if you click on the title, the blue title of the systematic review, you get a link to PubMed. And then through PubMed, you can get access to the abstract. And frequently, you can get access to the article from the publisher. Some of these are open access. Some require subscription. Um, if you are an ADA member, you can contact the library, ADA library, and we can give you a copy of the document for $7. Otherwise, if you purchase it directly from the, the publisher, typically it's around $30. And something that I'm saying today for the first time ever, um, we just got a subscription to Cochrane for all ADA members. So that's new as a result of some people who have been involved in our EBD Champions Conference. Um, you can get access to that from the ADA library page of ADA.org or also from the home page of our EBD website. So first time I'm ever able to say that. It took a long time to make that happen. So who writes these summaries? Well, we have a group called ADA, ADA Evidence Reviewers. And I used to be able to write the name of every ADA Evidence Reviewer on my slides. So we started out with 12, and then we had 22. Now, we are, by the end of this year, we're going to have 70. And I mentioned that my eyesight is going. Um, I can't read that small font, so I can't uh, list everybody's name. But thank you to everybody who's involved in this program. I know we have at least a couple ADA Evidence reviewer in, Reviewers in the audience. These people write the summaries. Um, and they receive some training to learn how to write the summaries. It's an application process. We have an oversight committee that identifies who's admitted to the program. They attend this workshop. We have some mentoring. And it's really a pretty neat editorial and review process to develop these summaries. Now I'm going to turn to our second bucket of information. That's our clinical recommendations. Um, many people would call these evidence-based clinical practice guidelines. We don't. Uh, I can go into the details of why we don't call them that, but it's probably going to bore you. But we call them 8 clinical recommendations. These are a very different type of organism. Um, for this, we have a general topic, sealants, fluoride, oral cancer. And then we think about not what questions the researchers have, but what questions do the practitioners have. And then we start with those questions, we do a literature search, and we convene an expert panel. This expert panel is anywhere between 10 and 20 individuals. When we say expert, we're talking about topic experts, so we're talking about EBD experts, and then also some key stakeholders. It takes about a year to two years to develop these recommendations, and they are another tool that help dentists implement EBD. Now, when we publish these, we publish them in JADA, and we have our nice technical document that is between six and 10 pages long. We want to be very transparent. We want everybody to understand exactly how we came to these recommendations, what the science says, how we identified the science. And so those reports are really great. And actually, it's probably even particularly useful for this group, because when we go through this process, we learn a lot about we know, what we know. And we really learn what we don't know. And so each one of these reports has a list of research questions that I think would be ideal for PBRN. So if you're looking for topics, take a look at our recommendations and see what some of the questions are. 
So when we started doing this, we realized that the full report was really necessary, but it wasn't a really great chair side tool. So we had the idea of having an executive summary, taking these six to 10 pages and narrowing it down to about three pages. And we thought, this is gonna be great. It's gonna be a wonderful chair side tool. Everyone's gonna have it posted in their, in their operatories. And we were so wrong. <laughs> it didn't work. So we took that feedback, we had a few focus groups, we got some information, and now we've translated even further to these chair side tools. And this is a picture of the one that we have for topical fluoride. We have a similar one for sealants. They're available through our website, the EBD website. If you want a laminated copy, you can give us a call. We can send you laminated copies. These are being used. People are downloading them. They're calling us, asking for more copies. Several dental schools are incorporating it into their teaching. So we finally feel like we have a tool here that people are using. Still always open to feedback, um, but wanted to let you know a little bit about that program. So now thinking back to that um, EBD, symposium that we had in 2004, they wanted a website. They told us our website should have a couple things. It should have a database of systematic reviews, which we have. It should give you one-stop shopping, which is the second th thing I'm gonna talk about right now. And it should have a registry of clinical ideas. So I'm gonna talk about the one-stop shopping. We agree that we want this to be the place that dentists go to first. But we also would be foolish to think that the ADA is the only one that's ever gonna develop anything of use. Um, there are so many awesome websites already out there. So what we have is a resources page that has links to all these other resources. We have links to other databases, other areas that have, that have summaries, um, tutorials, a variety of different things. So if you're interested in implementing EBD, I would encourage you to go to that resources page and see what we have out there. So now let's talk about the Suggest Clinical Ideas. Again, that advisory or that um, work group that the different stakeholders want us to have this registry of clinical questions or clinical ideas, just for people to say what they thought was important. And I've got to be honest with you, I heard this, I thought, well, are people really going to use it? And even if they submit these questions, what are we going to do with it? Well, I can be honest with you that the day that the website started, was launched, this was my most informative and interesting part of the website because people were submitting questions. And you can ask what we do with those questions. Well, remember now we have this database of 1,300 systematic reviews that we need to summarize. We can't do them all, but now we know what questions are important to you. That helps us prioritize. We have these clinical recommendations that take two years to develop. We have expert panels. We've got to be pretty picky on what we choose. Now we know what's important to the practitioner. This is helping us in the work we do. This section is also very transparent, and I would hope that some of the PBRN people here would take time to snoop around. I invite you to snoop around. So if you go to that, the Suggest Clinical Ideas area, you'll see the most recent suggestions. You click on a vote now, vote now feature, and now you will see a topic index. And you can go topic by topic and see what are the questions people are asking. And they can vote on it, and the more votes we, they get, it goes to the top of the list, it get, tells us what's important. We can see some questions about restorative dentistry, cariology and caries, and implantology. So again, I encourage you to use this information. It's open access. We want everybody to have this, this information and apply it. So who oversees the, the website? We have a group called the Critical Review Panel. There are 13 people on this panel. We started out with five. You can see that these are some very knowledgeable and talented people in evidence-based dentistry from all over the world. It's a great honor to be able to work with these people. They are passionate about EBD and getting it into the hands of the practitioner. So those are the main ways that we disseminate information. Now I wanna talk about how we help people implement, implement EBD. And there's two things I'm gonna talk about. The first is the EBD Champions Program. I like to think of this as a great introductory course for evidence-based dentistry. It's two full days, but we have a third half-day uh, optional pre-conference workshop. This workshop, um, we teach people how to use the web to identify evidence, so how to use PubMed, how to use the EBD website, how to use several other websites. And then we have the two-day conference, and then listen from a variety of speakers. We have those EBD experts that are up there talking, and we have a lot of practitioners who are everyday people all over the country, and they're implementing EDBD. What are their experiences? 
We have lectures. We have a lot of time for group discussions, a lot of networking going on. And we're asking these people to do a variety of things. We're asking them to learn about EBD. We're asking them to implement EBD. And that's a challenge. They need to internalize it, want to implement it themselves. They need to get their staff on board and talk to their patients about it. And then we're asking them to disseminate. And that's the champion's part. We're asking them to talk to their colleagues about it. And we are carefully evaluating this program. We do a survey before the, the conference, at the conference, and eight months later to determine if they're changing anything that they know, if they're changing what they think about EBD, any of their behaviors, and how they're disseminating. And they're doing a great job disseminating. We have people just talking to colleagues. We have people starting study clubs. We have people giving lectures, and there's actually a guy who now has a blog, and every month he gives a new topic that he discusses, a very specific topic related to EBD. So it's been a wonderful program. Um, unfortunately, it's just a couple weeks away, and we're already booked in terms of registration for this year. We're looking to have the conference again next year, so please keep in mind that that um, hopefully will be available. I also want to say it's actually a really fun conference. In addition to learning all these neat things, last year we had opera singing, we had hula dancing, and chants, so it was really a great uh, activity. So here are just some of the comments that we received last year. And I like the last one. They talk about the passion of the presenters, but I think that that's an underestimate because everybody in the room was passionate. The entire audience is what made that conference really a great conference. So now I want to turn to a collaboration that we have with Foresight. So if the Champions Conference is an introductory course, this is a very intensive course. What we've had over the several, past several years is people saying, I want more in-depth training. I'm going to know how to critically appraise some of these articles, the systematic reviews and RCTs. So we had a need. Um, at the same time, Forsyth had been collaborating with Oxford University for over 10 years to offer an, an intensive EBD course at Oxford. And that course was very popular, but they noticed that they didn't have a lot of participation from North America and South America. Obviously, it's a, a big expense to travel over there. So they wanted to bring the, to the US. And this was a great collaboration. We had a need. They had a solution. So we worked together to bring this um, to Forsyth. They offered the course last year. was the first time we offered it. It's a one-week course. Um, target participant is just about anybody who's interested in EBD. We had people last year that were from private practice, from education, from research. We had people from the CDC. We had um, ed ed editors from different journals. It was an international group, most of people from the US, but we had some people, several people from South America, Russia, and one individual from um, Egypt. And I'm going to talk about him in a minute. What you get, well, it's a one-week intensive course. Again, we're talking about critical appraisal and more advanced searching techniques learning how to implement EBD. Um, it is a very hands-on course, very little lecture time. We do have three hours of statistics. Um, and it's kind of challenging to sit through three hours of statistics, so we tried to break it up for you, but it was great. And then you get a boatload of CE. I think at the end, it's something like 45 hours of CE. So this is the group that we had last year. Um, the main instructors were Rick Niederman and Derek Richard. Rick is from Forsyth, and Derek is from Oxford. We also have in the center in the blue sweater was uh, Sergio Uribe. He is from Chile. Um, I received an email from him that him and his family are safe after the latest earthquake. Um, he also participates in our, in our website. We had folks, like I said, from um, the CDC. On my screen is the right, and I think on your screen is the left, the gentleman in, um, with the blue shirt and the tan pants. He was our friend from Egypt, Ahmed. He's a dentist, and he's working on his PhD. And he traveled all the way from Egypt, and he wanted to make sure he got his money's worth. So whenever he didn't under, understand anything, he said, stop. Do it again. So he made the instructors work hard. And then Thursday night, so the night before the last day, we all went out for a group dinner in Chinatown in Boston. And Jenny Cleveland from the CDC got up and said, OK, everybody, we needed to have some fun. Let's talk about what we would be doing if we weren't in dentistry. And so everybody took a turn. And this is Ahmed standing there, because he said, 
If I wasn't a dentist, I would be a soccer player because all the women would come after me. <laughs> now talk about what they did afterwards. This guy went back to Egypt and basically took the course to his dental school and taught the faculty how to do EBD searches and how to implement it. And it's just another great example of this continuing learning, knowledge, knowledge dissemination. And even though this wasn't the EBD Champions program, he was a champion. He's now coming back to the US because he's going to participate in some of the website work that we do. So um, this was another fantastic course. We are offering it again. Last year was a pilot. It was very successful. We're having it again this year. So it's going to be the week of September 27th. Last year, it was the end of October. And I was very disappointed because I lived in Boston for five and a half years, and I wanted to see the Red Sox, and they didn't make it postseason. So we are making it earlier this year so that hopefully I can get everybody to a Red Sox game. So I'm going to leave you with a couple quotes. This is a bell-shaped curve. I don't know if any of you have heard of the diffusion of innovation theory. It describes how people use new innovations, whether it's an iPhone or something like EBD. We have our early adopters. And the majority of people in the middle of this curve are really looking toward their peers to implement something new. And I know I'm that way. When I, you know, I just got an iPhone, I had to wait for my husband to get one, make sure it was OK. And I had to make sure that my four-year-old daughter knew how to use it. Um, and now my one and a half year old son is very good with the iPhone. I figured if they can do it, I can do it. So I'm kind of in the middle of this curve. Um, but think about where you are in terms of implementing EBD. Here's a quote for someone who is a president of IBM in 1946. And you would have hoped that this person was an innovator. But I think not. And now this is a more current quote. And I love this quote. We think computing ought to be like a telephone or an iPhone. I think we're almost there. I think we're almost there. And think about where you want to be when it comes to implementing science when you're training your patients. Do you want to be at the cutting edge? Um, or do you want to wait to see what everybody else is doing? So with that, I want to close and say thank you. The website is ebd.ada.org. There is no www in front of it, and I don't know why. We were just told we don't do that. Um, I did leave some brochures in the back if you want more information about the website. I also left a flyer if anybody's interested in the Forsyth course. Thank you very much.